Welcome to the third episode in a Legendarium series about ancient Ireland. In part three, Neil of the Nine Hostages, we will talk about the Irish pantheon and the king who is said to have remade the island in his own image. The Roman era Irish prayed to a tribe called Tuatha de Danann, led by Dagda, or the Good God, Lord of Fertility, Agriculture, and Masculine Strength, who led the Divine Tribe. Celtic artists often represented Dagda as a plump old man who carried a magic staff or club that could slay nine men with a single blow. Yet he dressed in a rustic tunic that barely covered his bottom. He also carried a bottomless magic cauldron with a huge ladle so big that two men could stand inside it. As his club took life, his ambrosial pot restored it, and this has led some scholars to believe that Dagda's pot was the ancestor of the Christian Holy Grail. Being a virile patriarch, Dagda took many lovers, including Morrigan or the Phantom Queen. She, along with a trinity of two other Celtic goddesses, could transform into baleful crows whose screeches foretold the death of warriors. This divine tribe even included imports from the Roman world, including Belanus, a sun god who drove a blazing chariot across the sky, his influence from the Roman Mercury plain to see. Of course, the Romans brought coins to trade with alongside gods. In Scandinavia, Ireland, and other realms at the fringes of the Roman world, chiefs and kings often treasured these coins as talismans of the men they believed to be the god emperors who ruled across the sea. Coins decorated with the faces of Emperors Magnetius and Constantine the Great came to Ireland, likely through the Roman outpost in Cork Harbor, which housed a horde of silver ingots that fueled the rich Irish sea trade. During the waning days of Roman power in the late 4th century, a man named Neil of the Nine Hostages rose to preeminence within Ireland. If legend is to be believed, his wicked stepmother, since no legend seems to be complete without one, tried to induce his mother to miscarry by forcing her to haul water while pregnant with Neil. This would ensure that one of the stepmother's own children would take the throne. The scheme failed, and Neil lived in the care of a shepherd until old enough to claim his birthright. And once he did so, Neil forced his stepmother to carry water for the rest of her days. After settling family business, Neil, according to folklore, imposed his rule upon the royal houses of Ireland, forcing the five houses to give up hostages to ensure their loyalty. He also supposedly forced the other four nations of the British Isles in Scotland and Wales to come to terms, adding four more hostages to his court and assure the peace. In truth, we do not know for certain if a man named Neil of the Nine Hostages dominated Ireland as he is said to have done, or if he punished any wicked stepmothers. Nonetheless, it is generally accepted that a great king of the Uniel clan became a powerful force within the British Isles around this time. And for that reason, the ruling houses of Ireland claimed descent from him in the belief that each of Neil's brothers established themselves as kings of Irish kingdoms. Brian is said to have gained Connacht, Neil's son Ogan founded Eilic, and another son named Connell created Tyr Chonnally. And whether or not there is any truth to this legend, many kings of Ireland going into the 5th century counted themselves as Uniel, or grandsons of Neil of the Nine Hostages. The adoption of this descent system does show the extent of the Uniel clan's impact. 
Their southern branch inhabited the Midlands from the River Shannon to the Irish Sea, and meanwhile the northern Uniel ruled from modern County Donegal to the River Ban. And for half a millennium, until the time of Brian Baru, the Uniel clan held exclusive rights to the near-mystical Kingship of Terra or the High Kingship of the Island. Such kings rode chariots drawn by horses into battle while their followers marched on foot, and they continued to estimate their wealth in cattle which fueled the Irish sea trade with the Romans. Indeed, the famous Irish legend called the Cattle Raid of Cooley, which featured a hero named Loch Lunn fighting against Queen Mav for control of a mystical brown bull of legendary virility, shows the importance of cattle to Irish royal houses. Though later the subject of romantic fiction, the title of High King of Ireland was largely ceremonial going into the 5th century, part of a complicated system of lordship. In reality, the grandiosity of a title did not determine the power of Irish kings, but how much land they actually ruled. And given that the Irish interior was riven by bogs and forests and hills, it was rare for a single king to directly rule much land. More than a hundred kingdoms and sub-kingdoms, many claiming descent from the Uniel, created a complex and ever-shifting map riven by dynastic struggles, feuds, rivalries, and shifting alliances. At the bottom of this hierarchy sat village chiefs, with clan chiefs ruling two or more villages. Tribal chiefs lorded over the clan chiefs, and they in turn answered to minor kings. At the nominal top of the royal hierarchy sat the five kings of the so-called Five Provinces of Ireland, and as Rome crumbled, these kings began to grow rich not by trading with the Romans, but by raiding Roman Britannia, and in doing so, they would profoundly change their beloved island forever. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.